Okay, stats lesson three is the, called the normal distribution. So listen up, put your phones away, find this page, page 219. Okay, it's called the normal distribution. Sometimes it's called the bell curve. Uh, you might have heard that in like everyday terminology, like especially if you ever hear people talk about like the U of A or something like this, they say, oh, it's on the curve. It's marked on the curve or the bell curve. That's what it is. Yeah, it is based on an average. Good. The one thing I'll say, though, is like, I don't know if you've ever heard of people talking in everyday language. Like, if you talk about brand new babies that get born. Have you ever heard, of like, people say, like, oh, my baby's in the 90th percentile for weight? You guys have never heard that? Or my, my son is uh, in the 90th percentile for, for weight. You guys ever heard this? You've heard that? It just means that like that baby weighs more than 90% of all other babies born in that statistical group. So if you say someone's in like the 90th percentile, that means like they're better than 90% of the group in whatever they're talking about. Maybe it's weight, maybe it's height, maybe it's a grade they scored on a test. Okay. Now I would want you to imagine if we lined up everybody in this room according to height. <laughs> and if we put if we put the tallest people in the middle, tallest people in the middle, and then sort of the next tallest people beside them each side and the next tallest people Shorter and shorter and shorter on both sides, so it made like a symmet symmetry. You would get something like this. You see these bar graphs? These are just like frequency charts. Okay? And these frequency charts, they've been discovered in nature just from everyday uh, statistics. Okay? So, like, maybe I'm talking about soccer players and how many goals they score in a season. Or maybe I'm talking about a football team and the average weight for, the, for the each football player on the team. What would happen is we would get a curve that looked like this. And this curve is called the normal distribution. It's also called the bell curve. And it's about frequency uh, versus some specific data value. And these words all mean the same thing, Trinity, and they're going to direct you into what type of math you have to do. So when you see normal distribution, you have to be thinking this curve. And we're going to understand this normal distribution by an investigation. Yeah, so flip the page. I think this is page 220. Yeah. Okay, so here's a company. They sell light bulbs. Okay? Here's a company. They sell light bulbs. And they're going to test 44 of their bulbs to see right here. Highlight this word. Not like mean girls, but. Good. Very nice, Triggs. This is average. Okay. And they found that the average was pretty much 900, about 900. And then they found that the standard deviation was 50. All that can just be done with the calculator. Look at all this crap. Each one of these 44 data values, you'd have to put all of this where? All of this would go into L1. One. And now just make one gigantic list. Would I do that to you on a test? No. I make the test values like l you don't have to type in so many. Now, the next thing is the frequency chart. This is like the tally chart. So if you were, let's just do, let's do one 
one interval. Between 850 and 900, how many are they saying there are? There are 15. Let's see if we can actually do that. Let's find 15 that fall in here. 850 to 900. 850 to 900. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Did I do one by accident? Which ones am I highlighting? Was that your question? No. I'm highlighting all the ones that are between 850 and 900 just to see and show you where this chart comes from. One, one more, two, 850 to 900. Okay, count those up. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Did I miss one? Okay, thank you. All of those, all of those ones I checked off, they're between 850 and 900. Okay? So I just do a tally chart. There's 15 right here. Right here, 15. You see how that works? You have all this data, and then you have to sort it. Okay, so 15 ended up between 850 and 900. Now, just that would take forever, so we're going to just count off the chart. Now I'm just going into these intervals. Nine fifty to one thousand. Look at the tally chart. What does it go to? Six. And it's symmetric on the other side. Eight hundred to eight fifty. Six. And then the other ones are just one. Now I just want you to think to yourselves. Where is most of the data where is most of the data live? Is it all squished near the middle? Or is it spread out to the side? It's all squished to the middle. Okay. Like most of these bulbs should have the same average lifespan, shouldn't they? If they're made all the same way? And then, you know, af aside from a few anomalies, which are on the sides, most of the bulbs are all falling really close to the average, right? So, A, well, you can have your headphones in while we teach, right? Let's take your headphones out. Now, to find the percentage of the bulbs in that interval, you just have to take a total, okay? So what's the total number of bulbs? So the percentage would be, for the first chart, 1 out of 44. Next one would be 6 out of 44. And next one would be 15 out of 44. So those you want to convert to percentages. So 1 out of 44 is about 2.27 percent. So you're following along, you're typing in with me, 6 out of 44, I got 0 0.13, so that's about 13.6 percent. 15 out of 44 has already been done for you, 34.09 percent and then you'll have symmetry on the other side so
So what does that say? It says most of the percentage, like you got, and I'll write them in here for you. This one's about 34%. This one's about 34%. This one's about 14%. And this one's about 14%. Where does most of all the data live? Right close to the average. And only s a small percentage of the data is far from the average. And you guys can see that it approximates this normal curve that looks like this. Okay? It approximates this normal distribution, it's called. Okay. So using just sigma and mu, guys, this is mu, this is sigma. One stands for the average and the other one stands for the standard distribution. You have to write these values in terms of mu and sigma. So the first one, Harley, Tiana. Focus on me, please. 950 makes 950. So this is mu plus sigma, that first one. The reason we're doing this is we're going to be able to plot these values on the curve according to a standard deviation. It's already been started. Look at the curve underneath. See how you have 900 and then 950? We're going to see here that 34% of the data lies one standard deviation to the right of 900. What about 850? Yeah, mu minus sigma. That's one standard deviation to the left. You can put 850 to the left of 900. So I'm building the curve and answering these questions above simultaneously. Okay, where is 800 going to go on my chart here? To the left of 850. And how many standard deviations is it to the left of 900? Subtract how many standard deviations? Two of them. Very nice. It's two times. Now, 1,000... Oh, my gosh. 1,050 is way over here. If you're counting by 50s on this normal curve, so how many, how many standard deviations over is it? Three standard deviations over. So, and is it above or below 900? Above, so we have to add three standard deviations. We can fill out this chart now. So some of you can probably do it on your own, but I'm just, yeah, why don't you guys just follow me? It's basically, for the standard curve, you put the average right in the middle, and then you go one over, Two over, three over. That's standard deviations above. One each, two each, and three each. Standing in the middle, it's one standard deviation to the left, another standard deviation to the left, and then a third standard deviation to the left. No worries. So as you're waiting, copy down the board. <laughs> now 
Now, what you have to remember now is that the bottom two parts of this chart, they're always going to be like that. It's the data that will change. So if we changed all the data, you know, the average might be for the exam 50, and the standard deviation might be 10, like for your test. Maybe it's 50, 60, 70, 80, 50, 40, 30, 20. So it totally depends on the data. But the bottom two rows will always be like that for normal distributions. And they'll tell you, they'll say, the data is normally distributed. And then you know you have to use this, this model, okay, this statistical model. That's used all the time. I know, right? Now, I'm not going to fill out the percentages because it's all filled out on the next chart, on the next page. This guy here, you have to be able to use. So I'm going to use the word memorize lightly because this will be given to you. This will be given to you on the test. It will be given on the test. You don't have to memorize the chart, but you have to memorize how to use it. For this page, you can cross all this out. Um, just leave the, uh, the stuff in yellow you want to keep. The stuff in yellow is good. Everything else can just be gone. Keep the stuff in the yellow. So what it says in the yellow is that the area under this curve represents the percentage of the data that falls into these categories. If I cut this thing right in half, right down the middle, if the entire thing is 100% and I cut cut it right down the middle, what should all these ones add up to? Uh, yeah, and you could just quickly double check. 34 plus 14 plus 2. Is that 50? Very, yeah. If you add all these up, you'll get 50. So if it was a normal distribution and you scored the same mark as the average, how many people did you beat? How many people did you have a better mark then? 50%. Okay? Let's go back to this page. Let's say you found a bulb, one of these light bulbs, that lasted 950 hours. Did it last longer than the average bulb? How many bulbs was it better than? It would be all this, all that, which is 50%, right, plus this one as well. And that's how you use this chart. If you found a bulb that lasted 950 hours, it would be better than 50 plus 34. It would be better than 84% of the other bulbs. Like, that's a good bulb. You want that bulb, right? Uh, yeah, that's a good bulb. All right, let's fill out this chart so you have something to refer to. The mean of the data is zero. It's in the middle. And this chart here, they're using a, a z-score, which we'll, we'll talk about shortly, z-score. And the standard deviation is how much these go up by. What are these going up by? One. So the and what is it going down by? So the standard deviation is one. Now, what percent of the data is above the average? Everywhere you see mean, you can write the word average to help you for vocabulary. 
Good. 50% of the data is above the average. Now, what percentage of the data is within one deviation of the mean? Very nice, Carter. Say it a little bit louder. Good. 34.13. It was asked how much within one standard deviation. That's that red column. That red column there. That's just one standard deviation compared to the mean. Now, what percent is within two standard deviations of the mean? So then you'd have to add a little bit more. So you'd have to go 34 plus the 13, and that goes there. Use the decimals, and what do you get? 47.72, good. And then what percentage of the data is within three standard deviations of the mean? And are we answering these correctly? Or are we only looking at one side of the deviation? We have to think. Within one standard deviation, could you not go that way or this way? So you have to combine them. So this is 68.26. Because you need to think about this. Most of the people will score close to the average, right? So within one standard deviation, it's either way. Yep. Two standards, you want to add them all up. So 13.59 plus 13.59 plus 34.13 plus 34.13, 95.44. Now look at this. It says 95% of the data is within two standard deviations. So pretty much everybody is within two standard deviations. Once you're out to the th third standard deviation, you're talking about like anomalies, really, really odd. Like on a test, maybe one person gets 100, maybe one person gets like 10%. Yeah. So within three standard deviations, now you have to add in the 2.15 twice. So add the 2.15 twice, and now you're up to 99. Okay. Now these ones here are the ones where you want to do them one at a time. Like this one, between one and two. Where would you look between 1 and 2? Right here. 13.59. What about 1 and 2 below the mean? It's the exact same, just over here. Do you guys still need that? So again, this chart with all the percentages will be given to you on an exam. But you have to know how to use it. Try slide now.
Thanks, man. Okay, you gotta know these five properties. The total area under the curve is one. One is another way of writing Is that staff? Yeah. Okay. Just couldn't tell. Another way of writing one is a hundred percent. Ozzy, maybe if you wouldn't have your phone out, it'd be better. A hundred percent. All the people, all the data, whatever it is, all the information represents a hundred percent of everything that you're gonna care about. Total area is one or a hundred percent. Now the curve extends infinitely to the left and right, but does not touch the x-axis. Don't have to worry that about that. Okay, you're not going to get tested on number two. So don't worry about number two. The normal curve is symmetric about the mean. So if you drew a line down the middle, 50% is to the left, 50% is to the right. Okay, both one and three, very important. And number four, it just connects to number one all the data represented by the area under the curve. And then this is the tip off right here, number five. The mean, median, and mode are very close to the same value. Because like nothing in this world is perfect. If the mean, median, and mode are all very close at least, you'll have a normal distribution. You guys good on that? Okay, class example one, this is where it actually, like this, class example one, like this is a test question. This will for sure be a test question. It won't be the same data, but it'll be very similar. I just need you to scan the data. It's talking about how much babies sleep. Could babies sleep a lot? Could babies sleep a little? Could they be in between? And that's the data that would be... Uh, you know, taken by the nurse. Maybe the nurse is working in a ward, all these babies, and she's just collecting data on how much they're sleeping. Who knows? Okay, what's special about the number 12? Where does it live? Right in the middle. The middle is the louder? Average. The middle is the average. So the average is 12. It's the middle. Now the standard deviation is just how much you deviate from the mean. What does it mean to deviate? It means to be different. If I deviate from normal uh, practices, I'm being different. If I deviate, I'm different. So what's the standard difference? How much are you, ch yeah, deviant, that's exactly what it is. How much are you deviating from the mean every time? Good. See how it's counting by twos? So like what's C? 16. What's D? 18. Now go the other way. What's B? 8. And then what's A? 6. Is 6 close to the mean? Do you expect a lot of babies to be sleeping 6? No. Would you expect a baby to sleep 18 hours in one night? Okay, so it's got to be related to the average. So the standard deviation is 2. I want to just put how much you count by, but... Because remember, this is one standard deviation. This is two standard deviations. This is three standard deviations. 
So you can see we're counting by twos. Two, four, six as it goes up. Okay, we got the values for A, B, C, and D. Now here's how you use the chart. How many are between 12 and 14? No, it's this section of the chart. No, you got to go look at the chart and it says 34.13. on the previous page. That's how we use this normal curve. So like what percentage to the nearest hundred, hundredth does the infant sleep between 12 and 14 hours? Well, 34 percent. Okay, 34 percent of the time. How did I know it's 34? I just looked at the chart. I didn't do anything fancy. I just looked at the chart. Now I'll switch color so it's easy to see. Between 8 and 16, that's this column, this column, this column, and this column. You'd have to add all these up. Okay, I'm just using Davis's chart here because he's a nice guy. How many standard deviations is 8 compared to 12? Look at me. Look at the chart. Everybody's with me. 0 on the chart would represent 12. Negative 1 would represent 10. And negative 2 would represent... Eight. Norvisi, I think Trinity's having a hard time paying attention when you're constantly in her ear talking. It's been the whole block. Now listen. Look at the percentages. 13.59 plus 34.13 plus 34.13 and plus 13.59. Those four columns you have to add up. And that's all it is. It's very simple. Add them up. 13.59 plus 34.13 plus 34.13 plus 13.59. 95.44. Does it make sense that 95% of the babies sleep between 8 and 16 hours? Probably. Would they sleep less than 8? They're, not, they're babies. Would they sleep more than 16? No, that's ridiculous. Yeah, exactly. There's the, the anomaly, right? Yeah. But it doesn't say they're newborn babies. Now here, less than six. Less than six. So find six, and then what does less than mean? You got to go left. I think it's even less, my friend. I th it's the 0 0.13. Right here. Not even 1%. 0 point. Now, I know some of us sometimes struggle with the basics, but this one here, this is less than a percent. A percent is already very low. This is less than 1%. Right? Very small. It's like it didn't even happen. Okay. Why is it not possible at this time to determine the percentage of days that the infant slept for 13 hours? Because does 13 line up perfectly? Is 13 in our chart? 13 is not a multiple of sigma. So I can't find it. I got 12, I got 14, I got 16, but I can't do 13 because 13 is somewhere between 12 and 14 and I just can't do it. So we have to introduce this new thing. This new thing is called the Z-score. Okay, the Z-score. A Z-score of 0 goes right in the middle. A Z-score of 14 is 1, 16 is 2, 18 is 3, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. 
the Z score essentially just represents how many standard deviations you are from the mean. The Z score. I don't know, I say Z. So the data value 18, 18 is three standard deviations above the mean and so has a Z score of three. The data value 8 is two standard deviations below the mean and therefore has a z-score of negative 2. Now the data value 12 is zero standard deviations away from the mean and therefore has a z-score of 0. And the data value 13, I believe would go right in the middle here, so would have a z-score right in the middle of 0 and 1, thinking 0 0.5. The data value 13 is a half a standard deviation above the mean and therefore has a z-score of 0 0.5. Now the z-score is lovely. It's a really simplistic way to look at these normal distributions and there's a really nice formula that works with it. Okay. Don't worry about this last part. We're going to use the formula on the next page to answer C. This Z-score formula, it'll be on your data sheet. You don't have to memorize it. You just don't have to have to use it. The X, that's the particular data value you're going to use. So if I want to know what Z-score 13 is, X is 13. So X is 13 from that last example. It's whatever thing you're interested in. Okay? Those other ones you know. Mu and sigma. Positive Z scores, you're above the average. Negative Z scores, you're below the average. This chart is the one you'll get on your data sheet. When the new iPhone gets launched, what do you call the people that buy it right away? Fanboys? I like that one. In economics, they would call those consumers, they would call those consumers early adopters. Early adopters. They're the ones that jump on trends quickly. Like the fidget spinner, yeah. Like if you're the first person in your class to have a fidget spinner, you're an early adopter. Okay? So, that's the anomaly, the people that join at first. Maybe there's like 2% that start the trend. And then what happens, once the trend goes viral, or whatever you want to call it, once it goes um, critical mass, they call it, the critical mass, that's all the people in the planet, like, oh, that guy's got an iPhone, I got to get an iPhone. And look at all these people. That's the critical mass. If you're uh, starting a business and you're, you have a new product and you really think your product is really good, you have to get it out to people, right? Then people try your product and they go, wow, this is good stuff. And then after that, like say you sell McDonald's cheeseburgers. Maybe you're like, oh, come get a free cheeseburger. Come get a free cheeseburger. This Sunday, McDonald's, free cheeseburger. People come. They try your cheeseburger. They're like, oh, this is good. And then what happens? They get the word out. They get the word out. The number one thing in advertising is word of mouth. If you tell someone, oh, that place is the best, they're probably going to go try it, like a restaurant or something. They'll go try it. Word of mouth is everything. Okay, it is marketing. Good. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, you'll probably have to learn some statistics in whatever post-secondary program you're going to take, whether it's at Grant McEwen or U of A. Yeah, this is like a tails off at the end, yeah. This is the critical mass, and then these are the early adopters here at the beginning. Okay, let's fill out this chart. Approximately 68% of the data lies between negative 1 and, one and positive 1. And approximately 95% of the data is between negative 2 and positive 2. 
And pretty much all the data is between minus 3 and 3. Yeah. Like most of the people are going to be between three standard deviations either way. Because if you're three standard deviations off, you're, you're quite far from the average. Okay. You got five people on your basketball team. They all have different heights. These five guys or girls, they all have different heights. They want you to find the Z score for the tallest player. The one for the shortest player is already shown. Okay, I want you to take a look at which one was the shortest. 170. They told you that the average was 190. So what happens when you go 170 take away 190? What if you're less than the average? You get a negative. The negative tells you that you're to the left of the average. What do you think is going to happen when we use the tallest person? Yeah, because the tallest person will have a height that's bigger than the average. So use this formula for the tallest person. It's 212. Take away the average all over the standard deviation. Basic skills here, folks. Listen up. Make sure when you pop this in your calculator, like, do the top part first. Hit enter, and then divide by 15. Like, be smarter than your calculator. So 212, take away 190. Do that first, and then divide by 15. There's, like, some invisible brackets there, okay, guys? I just don't want you to get screwed up on the easy stuff. 1.4... Seven. Why is it seven? Because it's to the nearest hundredth. Okay, one point four seven. The six 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 will round that seven. Okay. So that's the Z score for that guy. Okay. Here's Buddy. Buddy's got tests in math, chem, and physics. Okay. So, Buddy's. Buddy is the particular score, like whatever Buddy got. Okay, Tony. Tony's my buddy. So these are this column is the X. These are these are these are his particular scores. The teacher has told them the average. This column is the average. So put mu on that column. And then the standard deviation is this column. So for each one of these, you just follow, you just follow the formula. X take away mu, hit enter, divide by sigma. So 74 take away 68, hit enter, divided by 12. Zero point five. Very nice. Remember, X take away mu, so 79 take away 73, hit enter. Divide by 14. 0 0.43 after rounding. 68 take away 66. That's 2. 2 divided by 11. 0 0.18. These are all the Z scores. These are all Z scores. It's just, yeah, go. Oh, yeah? Yeah, for sure. Now, which one, which one of those tests did Tony do the best relative to the class? That's the key word there. And a lot of you, I noticed on the test I just marked, some of you are having a hard time reading. So read carefully. Read carefully. Tony performed better than... In his, like, take a, like his best mark was chem, right? His best mark is chem. His best mark is chem, but, but, 
relative to the class Which one did he do the best in? Well, the highest Z score. Relative to the, yeah, relative to the class, look at the highest Z score. He did the best relative to the class in math. So like if this guy went to the U of A, He'd probably get a C in physics, or C plus in physics, because he was just above the average. So he's got C plus in physics. In chemistry, he'd probably have a B, and in math, maybe a B plus. Because at the U of A, it depends how have you done compared to your peers. So if you go to the UVA and you compete with all the strongest students from around the world who want to go there. Yeah. Yeah, so those are like, ex those are like extreme cases and they, they'll adjust, they'll adjust for that. Yeah. You might not get the A plus, but you might get an A minus. Yeah. Okay, the average mark on an English exam was 63. Standard deviation is 12. If the marks are normally distributed, and that's the key word there, if the marks are normally distributed, now that tells me I get to use this formula. Z is 1.5. Then what's the actual mark? Okay. Z equals X minus mu over sigma. Plug in what you know. 1.5 goes in for Z, X is my unknown, mu is 63, and sigma is 12. Now just stare at that for a second and I want you to think, what would you do here to solve algebraically? Would you add 63 or would you times 12? That was quick. This is where a lot of students need support. They, they have a hard time solving equations. The first thing you need to know is you have to undo operations. Right now you have a subtract 63 and a divide by 12. You have to undo those by doing the opposite. So what's the opposite of dividing 12? And then what's the opposite of subtracting 63? Now, in which order do you accomplish that? It's actually like opposite of bed mass because you're undoing bed mass. You're undoing bed mass. Yeah, that's not a good rule to go by. Bed mass. Don't think bed mass when you're doing that, when you're doing uh, equations. The way I like to think of this is you want to. Well, it's not entirely clear, but we talked about it above. There's these invisible brackets here. Those, there's some invisible brackets. Because I have to take all of x minus 63 and divide it by 12. So what you want to do is, yeah, multiply by 12 on both sides. So then 12 times 1.5 should be 18. And then you got to undo the negative 63 by putting in a positive 63. Okay, so 81, you guys. Question? Comment? Good. You can't use a negative 63 because it's like locked in this treasure chest, and you got to unlock it with a key, and that key is by multiplying 12. Yeah. Good. Okay. Here we go. The weights of a large shipment of cantaloupes. 
Normally distributed. Average, 2.3. The weight of a particular cantaloupe is 1.7. which is 1.01 .01 standard deviations below. Hopefully that's okay for people. Why is Z negative 1.01? .01? Because it's 1.01 .01 standard deviations below. And then it wants you to find the standard deviation. So Z equals X minus mu over sigma. What I'll do here is I'll cross multiply. So then you get theta equals X minus mu over Z. You've seen this before in Math 10, I know you have. And again, if it's upstairs on the left, the only place it can go is downstairs on the right. Because this is like fraction equals fraction. Now I can finish this off. 1.7 minus 2.3 over negative 1.01. .01. You'll end up with a negative divided by a negative, which will cancel for positive. Okay. Negative 0 0.6, negative 1.01. .01. Those negatives will cancel. And I got 0 0.59 nearest hundredth. 0.59. A few minutes, and then you're free. Okay, <laughs> last one, guys. So, the marks on a math test. Here we go. The average is 52. The standard deviation is 12. The professor thought the exam was too difficult. He decided to adjust the marks by raising the average to 65. So the new average is going to be 65. And the new standard deviation is going to be 10. But he leaves the Z scores unchanged. So what will your new mark be if your original mark is 34? So I'm going to leave this one for exercise because you're going to run out of time. But I'll show you. You have to use this information to find the z-score. Once you find the z-score, then you go z equals x minus mu over theta. And I apologize, this is the, the wrong symbol. That's a theta. And then you find the new x with the new mu and the new sigma. You will have time to work on this homework tomorrow. Tomorrow's class, I won't be here. You will have this homework and the quiz.
Yeah, put back the calculators. See you, buddy.